of you probably know who he is. He's put out some great products. He's a filmmaker. He's a sleight of hand expert. He's an expert on scams and cons. He's an old friend. And uh, I don't even know what we're going to talk about. He's a man of many talents and interests. We'll see where this goes. Hi, Paul. Let's talk about Jason England. Yeah, that's a good topic. Let's talk about that's Jason. That's a good place to start. <laughs> Do not please ever ask him that question about me. <laughs> We have uh, we have what what I think we call um, a policy of mutually assured destruction. Yeah, you know, I, that's, a good, that's a good policy. And photographs about what. Okay, one in fact, so, maybe we should just skip that then. Yeah. You know, Jason, you you jumped in a car with him for some reason when across country. Was that for our magic, or was that a different uh, project? We've done that a few times. We um, we did a Stay thing ahead called of the revenueers or something. I don't know. It, a, a lot of it was that um, to have any revenue at all at, at one point. <laughs> I think I think um, we did a thing called the Unreal Work years ago, which is a disc where right. he recorded some stuff, I recorded some stuff. We had it edited together by the Buck Twins, and we did it. We took it to some lecture in Vegas or something, and then we decided to um, expand on it. And one of the things we did on the second one was we jumped on a on a train from Denver to Chicago and. Um, we, we filmed ourselves late at night on the, you know, in the, ca in the, well, you listen, know, that carriage. Hey, I've never done that. How and, was the train ride from Denver right? to Chicago? I bet it was beautiful, right? It was really, really great, except for the fact that, you know, we had to get up in the middle of the night and film yeah. when everybody else was asleep. You but it work. I'll tell you what, it was a great ride, but the ride going the other way apparently is better. Just, you know, you see better. more. <laughs> that's what I, I don't know why it's the same well, way, but that's right because telling. it doesn't include Jason England. He's already maybe the train. Maybe, but that was a, that was a cool trip, and it was a it was a, a nice product. You know, we um, uh, we we had a form of fun doing it. <laughs> was that uh, what was the first time you started making films? So was that was like your magic filming magic projects? Was that was that how you kind of were your entree into filmmaking, or did you have an interest in an avid? filmmaking background before the magic thing took off? Magic was definitely um, a kind of substitute for not being able to do film when I was a kid. Because I didn't have the opportunities. There was no film school I could go to. I didn't have the support. And I loved magic, of course, and was... I, I actually think now that I've had the opportunity to go into it, that in, the two are so closely related that it I really was a, a good substitute. You know? and magicians. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the thinking is very similar, you know, it's not... It's all uh, the one-ahead principle, right? Um, some of it is the one-ahead principle. The most important thing is that that thing of um, uh, deciding what's inside the frame of attention, you know, I mean, that's really the of course. the thing that uh, I try and latch on to. And I try and, uh, I try and use magic a little bit in the filmmaking in terms of the storytelling as well, but, you know, it's um, if we get to do the next thing, there's actually a lot of in-camera illusion and... Uh, sort of Georges Méliès stuff baked into that. But, really? Um, so yeah. you have another project uh, that's out there, it's pitched and you're waiting to... Yeah, you know, we're... Uh, um, I mean, every project happens differently, but yeah. um, this one seems to have a lot of uh, good um, good stuff happening. I'm, I'm finding something that looks like wood so I can knock wood here. Yeah, knock wood. Um, I know, it's so fraught. I mean, I've kind of followed oh. from afar your adventures in filmmaking, you know, and I see your successes. And what's your most recent film, Isolani? How do you pronounce that? Uh, the feature film, the most recent feature film was Isolani, yeah. Isolani. Um, which, and Con uh, Men was great. I love that. Thank you. You know, we're I'm, I'm forced to do this at the very lowest budget end of the spectrum, which is in one way very 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 frustrating but in another way it's really impossible to get away with this stuff without being super creative on every level so that part of it i actually really enjoy you know we just did a short film a couple of weeks ago um a couple of weeks ago i mean a couple of months ago we did a short film where we, we had to do it during covid so we had to follow all the covid regulations and we had one room one alley and two actors who would be in the whole film. And then we had 21 acting students who had to basically play the other two roles. And we had to shoot all of them and then figure out how to do that and end up with a film that made some sense. And it was, uh, you know, it was logistically a nightmare, but it was actually quite rewarding. But um, it all comes back to the fact. Now that, I mean, you, you, 
you're, you're several films in now, several things that have been, you know, produced and released. Do, have you assembled a team? Do you have, uh, or do you uh, assemble a team for each movie, depending on what you need? Uh, availability is really the, the key. Uh, yes, I have a, a, a team of people that um, I like to work with in some departments or, you know, um, art department and uh, uh, props and uh, um, production design. There are people that I like to work with. The, the people who are closest to me, like my first AD, you know, I have a couple of first ADs that I really like to work with. And um, my certainly the last couple of things that I've done, I've worked with the same cinematographer who I think is probably one of the most, uh, oh, if he's going to see this, I'll hate him. <laughs> How are they going to see this? It's penguin magic. It's a magic. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, no, no one will ever see this. Um, I think he's one of the most talented young um, cinematographers. In fact, uh, our film, My Solani, was the, I think, the only Scottish movie to ever be nominated at Camry Image, which is kind of like the Oscars for cinematography. Wow. And really? uh, wow. that was a huge coup, you know, and it was yeah. mostly because we did so much with so little. Yeah. And we were up against films that we were never going to win that prize. But to be awarded best debut on that was really amazing. That nomination really killed. So uh, he, he and I have worked together. And my secret there was when we first met, he told me how much he loved magic and he always wanted to learn. And so I was like, oh, so I am now your I'm now your dealer. Right. Yeah. So the first trick is free. Give him a taste. Exactly. So uh, that's and he's now he's actually a very good magician as well. Now. Really? Yeah. Well, that's cool. So you, you know, you because you know, working with the same people, you guys have shortcuts. You have a little shorthand. You have you speak mm -hmm. the same language now. Get things done. Yeah, yeah. I I I have a really simple policy um, for everybody that I work with. Everybody knows it, um, which is it's my way or better. Which is to say that. <laughs> I don't, any, any suggestion is good if it's better. I've, if you just think we should do it differently, I don't care. But what that means is, is that if I'm lucky, I have a way to go in with it and everybody else has a better idea. Yeah. If I'm really lucky, I'll, I'll come yeah. out with a, um, wow, what a and great that's, way to approach. That's a great attitude to approach any kind of creative yeah. endeavor. You know, when we're working with a team, my way or better, yeah, you need a general, but if you got a better idea. Yeah. But you know, you got to open the door because, um, you know, it doesn't matter who or where it comes from, but um, you want people to feel like they are part of it. Um, and especially when you're doing it for so little money and they're doing it for so little money, they have to feel like it's something they're doing rather than something they're just working on. Now, I know it's not your film, but I really loved uh, Shade. And mm -hmm. you worked with that, uh, with, with Damien, you worked on that yeah. film. Mm -hmm. Uh, did you work uh, Shay, in any capacity? Beyond, I mean, school. you did a lot of the technical sleight of hand. Were you involved in the, any of the story? Or I know you were an actor in it a little bit. And, uh, but anything Damien else on the production I, side? Or did you just have yeah, it on the set? Damien and I were, uh, you know, talking for years leading up to that. And he was, he was going to put that movie on his credit cards at one point. I mean, he was just trying to you know, find any way to get that film made. And so I had looked at the script and, you know, we had talked about different scenes and, you know, he's no slouch when it comes to the card stuff and the cheating stuff either. So we would talk about that incessantly. And he kind of pulled a fast one on me. You know, he said, I've got the movie together. If you want to come over with an open ticket so that, you know, I could stay a little longer. Um, so I came over for two weeks and I stayed for months. I mean, I was there for months. But he pulled a fast one on me where I did not know when I got to L.A. that he is he was making a movie with RKO and that they had these very high level actors yeah. until we went to that, dinner one night and Stallone Gabriel walks in and Byrne gave and, Stallone and Jamie Foxx early in his career. And yeah. That's a yeah. Cool and you know, I, I was, um, was Melanie Griffith in that Melanie Griffith was in that. And, uh, you know, it's, it, when I look back at that movie and you see all the people, Mark, uh, Mark Boone Jr. Was in that. And uh, Hal, Hal Holbrook played the professor. Um, Hal Holbrook was amazing. Um, amazing. Really astonishing. And it, it was the perfect, I couldn't have written a better situation for myself to learn how to make movies or what that was required yeah. to make movies, but also the kind of, you know, dream scenarios came up where I, I was asked about, you know, just a couple of weeks into the movie, if I wanted to take over the second unit director's position, which was essentially a way for them to get a very cheap second unit director, but it meant that I would then direct the opening titles and, and a couple of the scenes 
Um, especially there was one scene that, that Damien was going to be in. So I was, you know, suddenly thrown into the middle of it. And I think that without that experience, um, I don't know what I'd be doing today, but that was definitely that key experience for me. That was a catalyst, wasn't it? Mm. Yeah. And it was a great experience, you know? Is it possible to see that movie these days? Is it anywhere? I understand it's on Amazon. I know it's on Amazon here in Europe, uh, so maybe in the US as well. The question is, which version are you yeah. watching? There are multiple. I know that there versions. was a controversy about the, what the studio released, and I was in the middle of all of that, and oh. that would make a great movie in itself. You know, there was a night where I heard some of the stories late at night. You know, oh yeah, we <laughs> broke in, we broke it. into the edit bay and uh, stole the movie so that we could yeah. edit it, and that was so that. Damien could then take it to Blockbuster and say, the movie you bought, there's a better version. All of that stuff is crazy, but it was, um, you know, I think I was really privileged to see Damien, you know, fight to make the movie in the first place, but then fight to try and get something close to what he wanted at the end. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't know if anybody's ever seen the 85-minute version that we were shown after they brought in this editor, this crazy editor. It was it was just awful. It was as awful as any movie. It was like taking The Godfather and turning it into, you know, a comedy. It was like that kind of awful. And um, thank goodness uh, Damien really st stepped up, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, what are you working on these days besides a new movie? Well, Mag magic wise. Yes, it turns out there's a little bit of time. A little bit of spare time. So uh, I have been working on some stuff. I've mostly been working on a book project, which I'm slowed, I slowed down on because I realized everybody's writing a book. They must be. So I, I decided to dead. write. I thought books were dead. Everybody's writing books now. Um, yeah, but, you know, nobody's got anything better to do. I just think there's going to be like 50 books and half of them will be great and half of them might not be. So I'm going to wait until those 50 are, oh, okay. have and wait until everyone's got a little bit more money. So I'm I'm writing and illustrating and um, actually laying out that myself, wow. chapter by chapter. Wow. So that's uh, and uh, practicing stuff I haven't done for you know years. See what happens, you know. Tell me about here's you know there's two people I regret I never got a chance to meet while they were still alive, and one was Fred Caps, and one was uh, Roy Walton. Mm-hmm. Um, he passed away recently, but he spent time with Roy Walton. Yeah, I met Roy, I guess, when I was about 12 or 13. I walked into, I was already doing magic for a while. I had some books and uh, I was playing with sleight of hand and I went to Glasgow. I, I was raised sort of outside of Edinburgh, which is only an hour away, but there was no magic shop. There was nowhere that was a, you know, there was no internet or anything. And I didn't have access to magazines. I just, any anytime I got a book, I got a book and I read it. I'm, I still have the book that my school had on magic. It's on the shelf behind me because I stole it. I'm ashamed to say. But I, um, I could tell you the same story on my end. Yeah. Well, it's, it's called The Puffin Book of Magic. And it's, yeah. a, it's this beautifully illustrated it. little book. And I love it. So I got really lucky in that somebody just happened to mention there was a, a shop that sold magic in Glasgow and I was there the next weekend. And um, I went in and I spoke to um, the man behind the counter. He asked me what kind of magic I liked. I said card magic. He showed me um, a deck of uh, poker size playing cards, which I'd never seen before. I'd never seen that size before. All cards were bridge size cards or, or smaller. And that alone was that blew my mind, you know, and um, I showed him a couple of moves that I was doing. Like, for example, I could do the one hand top palm because that was in the book that I had. And he's clearly saying, well, maybe you should slow down and go backwards a little bit. And then he handed me this book, which was the Royal Road to Card Magic on that first visit, which wow. I bought. And he said, um, and this was the only hint that he knew anything about this stuff was he said, don't jump ahead, um, read it chapter by chapter and take it easy, Do you take it slowly. And um, I was back in once or twice a month because it was a train journey and I didn't have a lot of money. Um, I was just a kid and I went back and forward. And, um, and you know, uh, certainly through the whole of my life, Roy's been an incredibly important uh, part of that. And uh, 
even, you know, when I was in the forces, you know, Roy would write to me and send me letters and, you know, it, it was uh, one of the most positive wow. um, relationships I've ever had in my life. Yeah. Just, I, you know, and we very rarely, I mean, like probably only a couple of dozen times, we very rarely ever sat down outside of the shop. We always spoke in the shop yeah. for hours and hours and hours. And he knew something about every form of magic because he was, um, you know, he would go and see all the music hall performers when he lived in London when he was young. Um, so he would go see Edward Victor performing on stage. Is and, that right? Yeah. And, you know, he met Jay Marshall when he came through the, the London circuit and uh, became friends with Vernon, of course. So did he know Ramsey then? Yeah, he did. In fact, um, he was one of what they used to call Ramsey's boys. So there was a bunch of kids that used to follow Ramsey around all the conventions, and Bobby Bernard was one of them, and Roy Walton was one of them. Is and that um, right? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, and in fact, in the shop, there's a picture of Roy when he was a young man, much younger than we are now, a young man sitting beside Ramsey um, in the audience of an IBM show, both together, you know. Oh, and, uh, that's great. So, yeah, he knew Ramsey very well. And did his stuff very well too, you know. Did he? Yeah. 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 Very well. So you know, Roy was a very, uh, you know, very generous in spirit, but also he he had this really important knack for not giving too much too soon. So he would do things like suggest um, an effect that there was definitely a method for, and then leave you to see if you could figure it out. Yeah. And he did that many, many times. And um, Vernon like in that way. Yeah, I, you know. But I remember I was there was a cheating technique that I was really fascinated with that I knew he knew about, and I'd only ever heard a little, a clue in a conversation. I was with that kid. You know that kid that's always sitting around us now. He's listening. I was that kid, and I heard this line, and it baffled me. And then one day in the car, my wife was driving. I don't think we were married then, but she was driving. I took a card and I did something to it and it made this thing happen. And I realized this is what they were talking about. And it absolutely qualified. And so I went and I showed this to Roy and I said, you know, I think this is a, and I think if I do this and this, and he looked at me and said, you've almost got it, but you've stopped thinking too soon. And then about two weeks later, I figured out what he was talking about and I put the thing together. And, and now that's something that I do quite a lot. And it was that thing, if he just said, oh, that thing you're interested in, it's just this. I might never have even given it exactly. another moment. Yeah. Keep a little yeah. intrigue in the art. and Yeah. Make people I, and I think it's worth preserving that for the next generation, too. You know, I think, you know, it seems like you're trying to be secretive or, you know, using it as a power game type of thing. But but really what what I'm, I'm hoping is that you don't lose that sort of uh, um, the thrill of the chase. The thrill of the chase and also yeah. the appreciation for the thing itself. If it's easily gotten, you don't appreciate it necessarily. Yeah, I mean, if you get a trick every day, um, then, you know, how many great tricks have you forgotten? Yeah. You know, okay. and I've got, uh, because, um, you know, Penguin are very generous with me and they give me, you know, if I see something, I'll, I'll, they'll send me it to look at. And I'll look at things and go, oh, yeah, that's actually pretty good. And I went through that list a, a couple of weeks ago. And in the, and not just one, but a dozen things, I was like, how did I forget that? Yeah. That's fantastic. It's, and yet I did because I just got to see it and then forget the about it. The market has exploded. It's so huge. There's so much. I know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, yep. you know, my thing is always if I sit down and some layman wants me to do some magic for them. What am I going to do? Am I going to do something I just learned last week and I'm toying with? Or am I going to do something I know will rock their world or that I have fully developed? And there's only four or five things like that. So I'm doing the same four or five things for the last 20 years. And uh, it's like it's going to take something pretty great to knock one of those out of my top top five. But I think that's the way it should be, though. Yeah, I think, I think the way so, it too. Be. But Skinner, it, you know, Skinner used to walk around with a little index card, a little card in his wallet with every trick in his rotation. And he would move tricks around. He goes, OK, this week I'm going to move these back over here and just do these to, to keep them informed, to keep them polished. I know Carney does that, too. I, I would need that. I don't have the memory for tricks that I used to have. Unless if you're in a session with someone and 
somebody does one that reminds me of another one, I can do that for hours. But, yeah. you know, they have to start the ball rolling because it's different. But my ability with lay people is always, you know, it does always come down to those things that I know, as you say, that I know that they'll work. But I, I think there's some something good in the in the search for something that might find itself into that rotation. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, well, that's been the fun of, I mean, ever since COVID, I've you know been giving lessons and and kind of mm -hmm. turned back to my library and I'm doing research and I'm you know playing with old ideas and old principles and it's very exciting, again. And yeah, uh, yeah. I actually I'm reading some of these things behind me and uh, you know there's books back there that I remember reading and then I pull it out and I realize I don't think I read this or I don't remember this at all and it's yeah it all comes back to life again and you know and books are a much better source for me and I think for anybody who takes the time to develop that muscle uh, the reading muscle they're a much better way to explore ideas because I always find and I think that you might be the same I read a book and you know I read the trick and the trick is unfolding and I'm sort of reading what's happening. And then my brain jumps ahead and says, Oh, it must do this. Yeah. And then it doesn't do that. And then I go, Oh, that's interesting. And now I scoot off in that direction and I've, I've got a new toy to play with, you yeah, know? Exactly. But, um, that's right. Yeah. It unfolds uh, uh, as you read it. And also you start imagining yourself doing it rather than watching someone else interpret it. Yeah. And it becomes and dogmatic that's, that way. That's hugely important. But I don't think we should expect people to have to do that at the very beginning. I think no, that, uh, I agree with you. Yeah they, yeah, they should definitely be allowed to, you know, I think I think the way people come to magic and learn magic is changing. And I, I, do, I do think it's for the better. I think there are fears that are valid around YouTube and all that kind of stuff. But I like the fact that if, um, if you can get past the YouTube part, then you really have to be one of us really kind of in a way, you know, you have to, there's, it's not that you've gone through any trials and tribulations, but you are, you've, you've realized what's missing or something is missing and you're looking for something to satisfy whatever that is. And I think that YouTube is, I mean, you, you've gone through this. We go to a convention and, you know, hi, how are you? Um, I'm fine. How old are you? I'm 10. When did you start magic last year? What are you doing? The middle deal. Yeah. Oh, yeah. and you're doing it better than I've ever yeah, seen it. Done. Exactly. You know, that's because they saw on YouTube and they just assumed it was because it's it, look, you know, see it being supposed to be hard. It, you know, whereas, you know, for me, it was a harder journey. I think the uh, I think the, the thing that might come out of all of this once all of this goes away is I'm hoping that we have more people that have put a little bit more work into digging into the buried treasure that's out there um, yeah. in the books. And, well, I you know. seen, I'm very encouraged when I meet young people who are so well read and very mm -hmm. interested in, you know, more of the arcane knowledge and, and finding yeah. original things and digging through, like you said, the treasure trove. And, you know, the more superficial interest you have in a subject, like, you know, magic via YouTube and Instagram and so forth. And you see, there's a lot of superficial interest. That just means there's always going to be, let's call it 10% of any given number that's going to want to go deeper, go beyond the superficial and go, this is interesting. Yeah. What else can I learn? So the more superficial interest, that 10% is actually a larger slice of the pie now who's going mm -hmm. to go deeper. And I'm seeing it. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, it's uh, it's changing for the better. Um, I think that um, it's Well, yeah, it's I, good told somebody, I don't put any value judgment on good or bad. It's different. And I always have positive feelings about, I mean, magic's yeah. been around for thousands of years. And uh, I, I think it's, you know, it's going to be different, good or bad. I think it doesn't matter. You know, it's a, yeah. an eye of the beholder. But I don't think, um, I think that there has been, what do you think about this? In the past, I think the older generation deliberately held back the younger generation. Now, I don't think they were doing it out of mean spirit sometimes, but they were stalling them in a way that I felt hindered their development. Um, you know, like, uh, you shouldn't be learning that right now. You should be doing something else. And yet, if somebody has the, you know, if, if this fascinates them enough to learn it, it's like, that's great, but you're going to have to go backwards five steps when you're done. Yeah. I think there's something wrong in... in, in I think you're right. I think the culture of sharing is uh, stronger now. 
than it used to be. Yeah.